I'd like to talk a little bit about the whole political mode of uh, decision making in terms of the patterns that you see in it. Uh, there's one pattern in which you, you, ge you, you generate um, political support by creating a quote crisis unquote. Now since all human situations have some negative features to them, nothing is easier than to find something to complain of and to call it a crisis. Uh, a crisis does not mean that what you're talking about is any worse than anything else that human beings do. It does not even mean that it's getting worse than it was in the past. In a remarkable number of cases that I've looked at, the thing that is called a crisis has in fact been getting better for years prior to the policies. <laughs> now after you've, cr after you've convinced people there's a crisis, you have your solution. This is sort of a four-stage thing. First comes the crisis, then comes the solution. Typically, the people who advocate this solution will say this will lead to beneficial result A. The critics say this will lead to detrimental result Z. Third stage, they put the policy in, and the result is that it leads to detrimental result Z. The interesting part is the fourth step, where the people who attribute this detrimental result to the policy are accused of being simplistic for ignoring the complexities of the many factors involved. Moreover, the only cure for this new bad situation is more of the same policy. Let me give a couple of examples. First, the war on poverty. Now, the purpose of the war on poverty was not to prove that if you took money from here and, get, and put it there, there would be more money there than there was before. The purpose of the war on poverty was to end dependency on government handouts. That is, you would have an increase in spending, an investment, as they say, in these programs, which will then pay off down the road as all the problems that have been forestalled by this wonderful program now begin to subside. Uh, you can quote either from Lyndon Johnson or Bill Clinton, depending on who you prefer to quote. Large literature from both sources. And so, and retraining is one of the great magic words in both administrations. You will retrain people, including people who were never trained in the first place, <laughs> in order to reduce long-term dependency. So the predictions were made that if you had these programs, after some period of years, dependency on the government would decline. And of course, the opposite uh, pr prediction that dependence on the government would increase. And so the war on poverty was initiated. Uh, dependency. Uh, increased to, un first of all, the situation at the beginning of the, uh, of the crisis. Poverty had been declining in the United States for at least a decade. Dependency on the government to stay out of poverty had been declining for at least a decade prior to the war on poverty. Dependency on government began to increase almost immediately. As of today, there are more people in poverty than there were in 1964 despite literally trillions of dollars spent. And the only cure is more of the same. Example two, sex education. Now the goal of sex education was to prevent teenage pregnancy and venereal disease. And this was of course a crisis. Now for those of us who are t tend towards skepticism, if we look back at the actual data we find, the teenage pregnancy was declining for more than a decade prior to the introduction of sex education into the public school systems. Uh, by 1968, half of all the public schools in the United States had sex education. During the 1970s, the other half kicked in. Teenage pregnancy during the decade of the 1970s rose by approximately 50%. Teenage gonorrhea tripled between 1956 and 1978, and both those trends are still continuing. And the fourth stage, the cure for all of this, sex education. And now we come to a current example, the healthcare situation, or the healthcare crisis, I'm sorry. Now how do we know that there's a healthcare crisis in the United States? Because the president has told us again and again the president's wife has told us. The media have told us. What more could you want? Now, one of the, one of the statistics they throw around is that the United States spends 14% of the GNP on health care. 
Uh, no reason is given why a higher or lower number would be better. <laughs> Particularly in a country which is growing older and wealthier at the same time. Uh, Germany and Japan are held up as models because there they only spend 9%. I'll get back to Germany and Japan a little later. Uh, one of the confusions is the confusion between health insurance and medical care. And the second confusion is between medical care and health. Uh, we already have virtually universal medical care in the United States. The poorest soul in these United States who passes out on the streets will get medical care. He may or may not pay the hospital, but he will get medical care. The other thing is confusing medical care with health. There are tremendous differences in longevity within the United States. Mormons in the United States have a life expectancy a decade longer than the average white American. Is this because the Mormons have extraordinary medical care? Or could it have something to do with the fact that they don't drink, they don't take drugs, uh, and they don't go around shooting each other? <laughs> now, the favorite um, explanation for any problem in Washington is that our society has failed. And so prenatal care is held up uh, uh, as one of the ways of reducing our infant mortality. One of the faster ways of introducing it, uh, uh, reducing our infant mortality would be to collect the statistics the way they do in the countries we're compared to. <laughs> Was it, which is to say that when a very underweight baby is born in the United States, all kinds of medical treatment are given to that baby. And when the baby dies in spite of that treatment, that baby becomes part of our infant mortality statistics. In many other countries, no such effort is made to save that baby. And when that baby dies, that is counted as a stillbirth, not as infant mortality. So it's much faster to reduce infant mortality that way to make ourselves comparable to the people we're being compared with. A couple of years ago, there was a study which showed that um, prenatal care was uh, not as common among blacks as among whites, and that there was a higher infant mortality rate among blacks. The immediate conclusion was clearly it was one thing was the cause of the other. Again, being sort of battle-hardened about these things, I sent away for the study. And on the very same page where the statistics showed that blacks had higher infant mortality rates and lower prenatal care, it showed that Mexican Americans have even lower, pre, even less prenatal care than blacks and lower infant mortality rates than whites. And if one were to thumb a few pages on, one would discover that Americans of Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino ancestry likewise had lower infant mortality rates than whites and less prenatal care. The conclusion I would draw is that there is no connection between prenatal care and infant mortality. But of course, that's not a politically popular conclusion. There'll be a lot of bureaucrats out of work if we start thinking that way. Getting back to Germany and Japan. In Germany and Japan, people have more doctor's visits for the same disease and shorter visits each time. So one of the ways in which you can bring health care costs under control is to have someone go to the doctor 10 times for half as long instead of five times for twice as long. That way your statistics will show that you have brought health care costs under control. Now if you're an elderly person who has to stand out on the street in the winter waiting for a bus 10 times instead of five times, you may not fully appreciate the good that's being done for you.
One of the confusions that runs through the whole health care issue is the difference between controlling costs and controlling prices. Let me look at some of the cost differences that exist. Uh, an American doctor pays 14 times as much for malpractice insurance as a doctor in Germany. Nothing that the administration has said is likely to reduce that, that cost. In fact, given the political support of the Trial Lawyers Association for Bill Clinton, I doubt seriously if that cost will be reduced at all. Controlling prices is something very different. Nothing is easier than to control prices. You issue a law saying it is illegal to charge more than X for product A. They've been doing this not only for centuries, but literally for thousands of years. Uh, the Emperor Diocletian, back in the days of the Roman Empire, had price controls. Had exactly the same consequences as price controls under Jimmy Carter. Diocletian's reaction was very similar to Jimmy Carter's. <laughs> he wondered why people were so greedy. <laughs> now, now, one of the reasons the United States has higher costs is that we have better health care. It was fascinating to, to watch the President say that we have the best health care in the world. Yes, the best does cost more. Uh, you can always pay less and get less. But only by going through the government are you likely to pay more and get less. 